Okay. Hello, peeps at JS Foo. I am Pratik Bhatnagar, and I'm a UX engineer at Google. I work with Workbox team, and I contribute here and there with the PX CLI and other components of React. And today, I'm here to talk about progressive web apps. But I just, I'm pretty sure you must have heard better talks than mine about progressive web apps, read better blogs, better tweets, better tweet threads, and everything. So I'm just going to change this to progressive web games instead. Now, before we start, let's just have a look at the imaginary arcade gaming ti uh, timeline, or this is how it looks inside my head. So we started with Atari. Then we moved on to 8-bit uh, era, where there was Mario, Contra, and loads of loads other fantastic games. After that came Sega, one of the biggest game manufacturers in the 16-bit era. And then we finally moved on to super complex graphics cards, uh, consoles, platforms, PS4s, Xbox, uh, Nintendos, and way, way many. So this was the time we had game engines, super complex physics engines, col uh, collisions, lightning, shaders, custom uh, hardware being made for games like Counter-Strike. And after all of this, like all of this brilliance adva uh, brilliant advancements, this is what made into our daily lives and our daily uh, and into our pockets. Games with taps, with swipes, these all are really huge games. And no offenses, the games on consoles, PCs are still a huge hit. And hit me up for a, if somebody is interested in a Counter Strike match or two after this talk. But this has become a huge uh, contributor to daily gaming uh, daily gaming era. So some of these are like Candy Crush, where you swap and match the similar looking objects. Four picks, one words, which are like you're given four images and then few letters in the, uh, at the bottom as buttons. You tap and try to guess the word. Then is color switch, you again, you do nothing. You just tap and try to make your ball move uh, inside the ring with the matching color. And the fourth is the hop, where you just simply have to swipe left or right to keep the bouncing ball on the platform. All of this attributes to one thing, the rise of mobile into, a, into the computing industry. So, like, games like these were possible with mobile web for a very, very long time. But, so why did industry and why did companies actually cho uh, chose native apps instead of mobile, uh, instead of doing it on mobile web. Some of these reasons are like app icons, your browser, like imagine yourself sitting in your bed in midnight and then uh, if you're bored, you open your phone. Will you like go to a browser, remember a URL, type that URL, wait for that game to load and then start playing or instead just open your phone, whatever icon looks really nice to you, go to that game, go to, uh, go to that social uh, network instead. Next up is notifications. Just before PWA, service workers, and all of this came into play, notifications was a far-fetched dream, dream for uh, web. So games could not, or game developers could not reach back to its, uh, reach back to its users and tell the users that, hey, come back, play. It's been really long, or we have missed you. Third up is full screen experience. Games inside mobile web were like inside a browser with a URL bar, with a button, with notifications on top, and whatnot. Everything to distract you apart from the game. So native apps had full screen experiences from day one. Next up is in-app purchases. You are trying to buy a car, you are trying to buy by a character or a skin or anything uh, add-on for your game and you are redirected to uh, a, a payment app website where you have to type your password in a really, really small uh, text. Nobody would want to do that in middle, like when you are bored and on top of it, you want to do that. So for this comes the uh, payments API, the web payments API where you can do it do all of this in just a few taps and no small fonts or typing passwords. Next up is 60 FPS. We all know this, that web can get tricky with 60, uh, 60 FPS animation. So 
Luckily for us, I'm talking about progressive web games and I'll be doing all of this with Canvas, WebGL and OpenGL. So a lot of it becomes way more easier than doing this with DOM. So combine all of this, luckily when Service Worker came into play, when Manifest.json came into play and when, the, uh, when we started doing progressive web apps, all of this are now solved for us. App icons, add a manifest, your user will be able to add your app, add your game onto its home screen, just like any other native app. Next, notifications, service workers, easy. Tons of uh, code samples out there, add your, uh, add a push notification capability to your website. Full screen experiences, one single key in your manifest.json and whenever the user opens it from the home screen, opens up in full screen. No browser UI, no notifications bar, no native buttons, back, home, nothing. Next, in-app purchase, as I said, the web payments API helps us there and 60 FPS is what we'll talk through the rest of uh, rest of this talk. This, like, enough of the talking. This is the game, this is, this is the URL where there's the native game out there and we'll try to replicate building this one uh, along on this talk. So the, I'll tell you the gist of this game. Yeah, as soon as you uh, do touch your uh, finger on the screen, the ball starts bouncing. You have to uh, swipe left or swipe left, swipe right, and keep uh, try to keep the ball on these uh, jumping platforms. The speed increases as you uh, proceed in the game, and it becomes difficult. No, nothing more fancy, nothing complex, just simple this stuff. Okay, and with any other, uh, and like any other app or web app, we need tools. And I'm choosing babylon.js as my game engine, canon.js as my physics engine, Preact with Preact CLI as my, uh, for everything that is DOM, rela uh, DOM related and Firebase for authenticating users and hosting this particular thing. You might have uh, a thing in your head that this, all of this combined is a huge, huge payload. Like, these might not occur as a very wise choice on, uh, in your first look. So, that's what uh, I hope that you take the, uh, away from this website. We are going to build super, uh, super quick and super fast uh, progressive web game using all of this. Ha. So, we'll get started. Uh, this is the welcome screen for our user. Nothing, just one image, two buttons. I'm using Preact and Preact material components. I included them and made uh, my DOM. Three DOM elements, nothing fancy. And since there's no code, there's nothing fancy in here. Our interactivity time looks fine. It's approximately 1.1600 uh, uh, MS, which is on a regular 3G and a 10X slowdown CPU. This is here because obviously we haven't added any code. We haven't added any payload. Next come authenticating about authenticating our users. I'll use Firebase for it. So Firebase makes it really easy to authenticate your users with SMS, with email, with uh, Facebook, or whatever OR type you want, uh, and do a bunch of other things for you. Also makes it really easy for, to, for you to send push notifications and other things. Here, what I'm trying to do is just import Firebase app, which is the core uh, file for any Firebase application, and the Firebase auth module. I'm not using uh, the database or the notifications or any other module, just the auth module. And mind it, I've just imported it. No, uh, haven't used it, haven't written any code around it. This is our timeline. Pushes my time to interactivity one second ahead. Now, does this make Firebase bad? No, because it's a really, really useful tool. And since we are using it upfront, and since like it's a game and I have to like show the user uh, an option to log in here itself, that is why I started using it. But we need to fix this. I cannot push my time to interactivity one second even further. And this is on a uh, metered network. That is I've uh, throttled my network to a regular 3G. This can go even bad than this. So I need, really need to fix this. This is how I did it. I built a utility function which returned a promise. Next, this promise calls the require.ensure of uh, Webpack. Since I'm using PXLI, it comes uh, already baked with Webpack and its, uh, and its utility functions. 
So I call require dot ensure, which brings Firebase and Firebase auth uh, at a later point of time. Now this require dot ensure, if you would have used it already, takes a callback. So uh, this callback is called when these whatever files you mentioned in the array are downloaded. This callback resolves the first promise with a new function. I'm using a closure here, so this function will know of whatever is there outside the scope of this. This function, whenever it's called, actually starts using this, uh, using the two files, that is Firebase app and the Firebase auth. Why I did this? I wanted to download this file as soon as possible, uh, like as soon as the game started downloading, but I did not want it to uh, do all the parsing. I did not want the parser to pass through all of this file without even, if user want to continue as guest, I do not want to waste time parsing these files. So now, uh, exactly when user will click, so after these files are downloaded, we'll enable the uh, login with Google button. And when user clicks this, only then I'll call this return function and the parser will pass this thing and do the rest of the code. This is how somewhat the code looks like, require.ensure, app and auth, resolve it, uh, this particular returns a new function which resolves the promise. And this promise, I can use this, yeah. This, uh, this function, when it's, uh, it is called, when the user clicks on the login with Google, and then it's passed and then it's done later on. With this, we gain 800 ms of what we lost back in our hands. I still download those files, but I never use them, so parser do not really pass these uh, JavaScript files, and I gain all that time which was uh, being used to pass these things. So now a user can come in, he'll still get 1600 or 1650 uh, 50 ms of time to interactivity, but now he can choose not to go through all of this pain and uh, continue as guest, and I, these files will never be passed altogether. Now, lot of performance talk already did. Now let's see how we start actually building a game. After you are done authenticating your user with continuous guest in a dialogue or with the Google, you would redirect him to a new route uh, using whatever router you want. And here on this route, we put a simple canvas element. Canvas element, uh, position, absolute, top left, bottom right, zero, width, 100%, height, 100%, so it takes up the entire space. Now this is your entire stage where we'll build this entire game. So much like any other uh, JavaScript module or Node module, uh, Babylon.js also comes with ES6 uh, imports and everything. So we'll import a, an engine, a scene, a light, and a camera. We'll initiate the uh, engine, giving the canvas object, just new, uh, new engine, and the uh, canvas object, and then uh, we'll initiate the scene, giving it the engine. So new scene, no rocket science, just in, uh, instantiating new objects. And then comes an engine render loop. This tells, uh, whenever this function is called, you need to call scene.render to uh, continuously re-render your uh, game scene. This will give you a black screen, nothing like, there's no background color to this canvas, it's uh, the baby launches which has rendered a black screen because there are no lights and just a simple canvas. Next, we'll add lights. We'll uh, to in add lights to our game. We'll do a new hemispheric light. There are multiple kinds of light, point light, hemispheric light, and other, uh, and other stuff, which you can go ahead and read what exactly are the use cases of this. Hemispheric light is like a tube light in the room, which evenly spreads on your entire stage. So we'll do a new hemispheric light, name of the light, and a vector where it will be placed, where the source of the light will be placed, and uh, the scene to which it will be attached. So this dot scene, and the intensity of the light. So you can alter this intensity, and it will uh, reflect on your objects accordingly. Also, we'll attach a camera. So camera is what comes and define the viewport of your player. That becomes like the eyes of your player, where he's standing and where he'll be looking at the game from. So again, very simple, new free camera, uh, again, a vector where initially the camera is placed, and the set target where the camera is looking at. So this is like you're uh, standing at X and looking towards Y. 
This is all an empty room you can imagine right now where you have been just uh, kept at one place and you are looking at another one. There is one line that I have uh, written camera attach, uh, inputs dot attach dot mouse as detach control. For my game there is no uh, way where the user can move its viewport or mu uh, look here and there. If you do not th uh, do this by default with mouse or uh, with the WASD keys the user can look left, uh, left, right, top and bottom since it is a free camera. Okay. Now we will start adding objects to this particular stage. We will add one platform and the ball on top of it and some more platforms and then we will start uh, beginning the, uh, you know, start the animations and everything. So this is how you add a simple box or a simple platform in JS. You do a mash builder dot create, uh, create box, you give the name of the box uh, and its size and its height. So this is like JS has its own matrix system so you might take some time to get used to it. It does not really work in pixels. It's, uh, it has its own matrix system so two on uh, this device might give you a suffice uh, size of your platform. After this we give it a material, there are standard material, there are uh, uh, there are reflective materials which will give you a reflection kind of uh, thing and there are there is a water material and more materials like this. So I use standard material, gave it a color and gave it a position. So on X you stand on 0 and on Z you stand on uh, minus 16. So have a, we are having a simple uh, box in our room floating on X 0 and uh, towards us since the Z is six, uh, minus 16. Next up, we'll put this logic inside a loop, and we'll build ten of such uh, ten of such platforms. So this is like new create new box, and we'll randomize the X position of it so that user has uh, the difficulty of swiping left and right, and then he has uh, platforms at different places to make the ball jump at. And then uh, we'll keep incrementing the Z position. Since we are incrementing the Z position by eight, yes. So uh, first one is here, second one is here, third one is here and so goes on into that uh, empty space. So this was all about adding platforms. Now we are adding a ball. We are, uh, since we know where we place, it's a static thing with this game, uh, we are, where we placed our first platform, we will create similarly the, uh, a sphere. So this is uh, how you create a sphere. Uh, mash builder dot create box was to create a platform or a box. Mash uh, builder dot create sphere is how you create a sphere out of it. You give it a diameter, you give it a scene, and it starts rendering a gray or a black ball in your scene depending on your lighting source. Now, using the position uh, attribute, I again just place this ball exactly in the center of the uh, exactly on the center of the first box. Any anything conf confusing so far? This is like all simple new instantiating new objects and placing them at X or Y. Just imagine this like placing your DOM at uh, certain positions. Now we need to add texture. First is the way Babylon uh, JS includes uh, texture is like you give uh, it the file path and uh, the object to which to apply the uh, texture then it will uh, like include the file, try to download the file and then uh, apply it to the object. What this can do is, imagine you have already presented the scene to the user and now baby Lone JS is taking time to download uh, this particular image or the basketball image that we are using here as a texture. So your user sees like an unstyled uh, sphere in your, uh, in your game. This is an equivalent of flash of unstyled content in your uh, daily, daily use apps. So what we did, we uh, first download before this game will actually start, we will first download this image, create a canvas of uh, image height and image width what we downloaded, never added uh, this canvas to DOM though, then we draw, uh, then we will draw that image on this canvas and then extract the uh, base 64 string out of it. So with this base 64 string, uh, babylon.js gives us a separate function to create a texture from base 64 string. So we will give this base 64 string to this uh, function and it will 
give us in return a texture which we will apply to, uh, to this particular sphere. So this will give us what we are seeing on the right hand side, a green uh, box, a 10 green boxes and a sphere sitting on top of it with a particular texture. Now, like any other game, we'll need animations to support our game. So, uh, the first series of animation that we'll add is, as soon as game opens, our platforms will fall down and from opacity 0 to opacity 1 and uh, from a particular height to, uh, to height 0. There are two kind of animations. Uh, First uh, is the keyframe animation that we'll be doing here. So keyframe animation, you say that these are n number of keyframes and these are the stop points. So we'll use and for start and end keyframe only. So at frame zero, opacity animation, the value of opacity will be zero. And at frame 20th, it will become one. The next one is the dropping animation, which is like at frame zero, it will be at height three. But by frame 20, it'll, it would have fallen uh, at, height, uh, at height 0. Combine both, this is how it will look. But these are just keyframes declared. We have not attached to which property will it be applied to, to which object will it be applied to. This exactly is how you do it. You instantiate a new animation, give it a property name. So like you would want to alter position dot y or opacity with this frame rate with which you would want this animation to run or animation type. So this can be float animation or uh, geometry animation where it will be, it will be doing matrix kind of matrix uh, manipulations for your animations or color animation since color is a four value or a three value uh, animation. So that you can choose from here and the type of loop. So will it be a constant loop? Will it be looping forever? So since we want it to play just once, I've done constant. Next is we add keys to this particular animation, the keys that we declared in the pre uh, previous slide, that is from uh, frame zero, it's at height three and frame 20, it's height uh, zero. And then to the, uh, to the object, we do animations.push this animation from which frame number to which frame number and will it be uh, will it be appendable? So this appended to box will provide a falling uh, a falling animations. You will need to do a same similar kind of code for opacity as well, and just do a box dot animation dot push opacity animation as well. So both of them will play together, and uh, it will look somewhat what it's looking on the right hand side. Good. Now comes the scary part: physics. With every game comes in collisions, with every game comes in uh, game engine, impulse, mass, restitute, and every other kind of uh, horrifying term that you would have heard in your university or your high school if you are afraid of physics. So uh, imagine like implementing all of this by hand. This is just too much work to do, but this is how JavaScript community works, right? You throw a problem to it, and then NPM will shout, here are 64 solutions to it. So, uh, thanks to JavaScript community, nothing is really scary for us. There are uh, physics engine which takes care for all of this. Okay, let's now see the code, how you add physics. Again, there's no rocket science again, just like your low dash or any other kind of uh, dependency, just import it. Babylon.js somehow, uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, completely right here, but expects uh, physics engines to be at window scope. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I wasn't able really, I wasn't able to scope this to anything other than window. So I did a window.canon to uh, canon. Canon is our physics JS, uh, physics engine, which implements methods for collision, how gravity will work, how mass will work in, uh, with your objects. This, uh, and this is how you uh, enable physics in your scene. So you have to do scene.collisions enable true. So now it'll, your scene will, start uh, detecting collisions between objects to which you tell uh, it to do and then enable physics. This will start uh, enable normal physics uh, stuff like gravity and all to objects. So one thing to see here is worker collisions true. 
what we'll do is all your collision computation, which is a lot, uh, if there are two objects uh, colliding, so there's a lot of computation to be done. It will defer it to a different web worker altogether. You don't have to write the web worker. Babylon.js automatically uh, downloads a web worker for you and does the computation here. You just have to do this one line. Next is uh, you have to add physics imposters. So Babylon.js uh, objects in the uh, on the stage them itself cannot do anything related to physics. So there are physics imposters from Canon.js. You add there's like a box imposter for box like objects, for a sphere ob uh, imposter, a cone imposter, and a mesh imposter. Ma not like the other three, which ma would make sense from their name: box, uh, sphere, and cylinder. Mesh imposter is a kind of impos uh, imposter which sticks to any shape object. So it's like the most complex imposter and helps you detect collisions. So for example, a box is pretty straightforward to implement, a sphere is pretty forward to, uh, straightforward to implement, but you have to detect against uh, a collision against a tree kind of object. There's a tree, not the algorithm tree, the uh, physical tree in your scene, and something is colliding with it, uh, it has different kind of shape, uh, even it can, it, you might want to detect collision with its leaves. So for such complex cases, you use mesh imposter. So you, uh, you instantiate a new physics imposter and tell it, okay, if, uh, it's a sphere imposter. To which object will it does? Uh, will it check the physics, everything? And give the mass in restitution. So restitution is if two objects collide, how much energy will they still have after uh, the collision? So if you do zero, they'll just collide and stick to each other. If you do one, there will be no energy loss and whatever velocity they were colliding with each other, it will be just uh, opposite in the opposite direction. So uh, we are not really exact uh, doing a lot of impulse and thing and we'll be manually checking for uh, collision. So I've kept mass and restitution as zero. Uh, next thing, you have to tell the objects that you have to check collisions for. You, you like you should not do all objects colliding with each other and checking with each other because that will be like way too much work. So I'm just doing it for uh, I'm doing it for the ball and for all the platforms. Next is the sim. Uh, it's a very similar kind of experience for uh, for the box as well. New physics imposter. This time the box imposter and to which it is has to be attached box. And you have to do the box dot check check collision dot is equals to true as well. Next, the event listener. Now our stage is set, but nothing is happening. There are there's physics enabled, but nothing is happening because we have not really started uh, started the game itself. So we'll do two DOM listeners. One is the touchdowns. As soon as the uh, person touch down, I'll save it as a reference point. And next is the touch move. So when he moves his finger, I'll use that reference point and uh, check the delta and try to convert it to a uh, Babylon JS matrix system. Okay. This is how our, our game is going to work. Ball is at the starting position. Within 15 frames, it rises to height 5, and with, uh, after 30 frames, it will fall down to height 0. This is how our ball will uh, look like it's bouncing. In parallel to this, I'll also adjust uh, the Z position to it. While our uh, ball reaches towards 0 again, We'll check if the ball dot position dot y is less than 0.5, which is like it's somewhere near to the next box, and if it's colliding with the next box or not. So this is like 10 boxes in an array. So I'll always check if it's colliding with the box at uh, with at the index one or not. If it's not at this point of time, we'll let it freely fall to height of minus 20. This is how it will look that the ball will uh, jump and it has fallen down to great height and the player has lost. If this thing, uh, if this check does not passes. If this check passes, I'll uh, pause the particular animation so that it does not fall below. And uh, I'll restart the animation with the new Z index values. That is from index one box to index two box. This is a total uh, animation of 45 frames. Yeah, and this is how it looks inside the code. We'll check uh, position dot Y is less than five or not. We'll check if it intersects with a new mesh, which is, which is the box at index one. If it uh, if it does, we'll add uh, we'll call the score callback, update the score somewhere here, and then start a fresh animation. 
next is animation events uh animation events in babylon is like if this particular frame has played or not so what i've declared is at 40th frame play this animation event and whatever uh, call this finish callback so this finish callback will tell so it was a 45 frame animation and at 30th frame it should have collided with the next box if it hasn't if 40th frame has actually reached this means that the ball has fallen down and we'll tell the user that you have lost so this is how our anima uh, animation events will work to any animation we'll just need to do animation name dot uh, add event and this lost event so if this animation plays up till this specified frame number then uh, this event will be called now all of this wiring up will give you the uh, game that we saw but here are some few bonus tips a your stage will never be scrollable scroll plus a uh, heavy animation does not really go well hand in hand next avoid the uh, uh, mash imposter as i said it's too much uh, computation and it might hurt your uh, frame rate at mobile browsers at this point of time second defer your collisions to web workers that we have like already discussed now progressive web apping like the whole talk was progressive web games i've told you how to build the game but the progressive web thing is still missing at this point of time if you try to trace your uh, trace your game there's a huge 6 second gap on your uh, on your timeline like user is literally sitting there and waiting for game engine to download your logic to download your assets to download your sound textures whatever this is bad let's fix this i'll put a prefetch uh, link rel prefetch tag into the header so as soon as the user lands on the login screen with the lowest for uh, this prefetch tag starts downloading your game engine and your game logic with the lowest possible priority so that whatever work user is trying to do he keeps on doing that but uh, your game engine is also started to has also started to download in lowest lowest priority checking after this now this uh, difference i'm not sure if it's visible but this difference is only 2 uh, and a half seconds you might say that we optimize for 9 800 ms in the beginning of this talk but now we are letting go of a 2 uh, and a half seconds there's a difference in that 800 seconds your app was not initialized you could not have shown anything on the screen here you could show a loading screen just like any other gaming device shows this this te technique is used even with uh, even by consoles today so you can do a loading screen here you can do a you can do a uh, linear progress bar or a spinner or anything that you want to do here your app is actually initialized you do not need to leave this blank now comes the service worker part much like native apps what they do is they uh, pre cache everything they install all the things related to your app at first and then uh, give you the app to interact with so let's just be web what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll install a service worker with minimum possible precaching just whatever uh, it is needed to bring our app uh, in offline state and then we'll install runtime caching strategies so what we'll do is when the user will actually starts playing it will then uh, intersect the outgoing request and whatever response comes in then gets cached so our service workers are not really uh, waiting for everything to download rather it's just sitting there Uh, with an empty cache and whenever uh, the actual outgoing http request happens it intersects that and then puts it into the cache how do you use uh, service so all of you must have seen multiple service worker talks and other things but since i'm using prexcli this becomes super simple there's a file called prexconfig.js and you have to use a prexcli sw uh, precache plugin i cannot really seem to remember that although i made it but yeah uh so there you just have to give this particular setting in a in a json object and it will intersect all outgoing uh, sound and texture files request and whatever response comes in gets stored into the local cache and enabling us uh, enabling our players our users to play this offline from second time last thing do not uh do not forget to add a display full screen this this one single key gives you a full screen 
displaying uh, cap capability to your game whenever it's added to home screen. And all of this is built and I'll be showing you the uh, a small GIF or a video from it and, and the URL, but some of, uh, and the code is also open source, so please feel free to go ahead and uh, contribute to it. Here are some ideas what you can do. Uh, while we, we saw a losing event, on that we can capture the entire uh, canvas and maybe share it with friends, the high score and how we lost. Next is challenge our friends with push notifications or even use uh, the point system that is already baked into the game right now to load more and more textures later on. That's all I had for today. I've been Pratik, you have been a great audience, thank you. Questions? We have some time for questions. Questions I see there, the balcony. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, can you please explain like why uh, using Babylon and is better or worse than Unity or Unreal Engine because they also provide these capabilities of developing games for across platforms, right? So, I mean, uh, is the physics engine really faster than those or? they provide some something better? Uh, honestly, I do not really have the benchmark numbers right now, but Unity and uh, I guess the Unreal Engine uh, uses the VASM as of today to export the game. And this is all what I built with JS, simple plain JS. I guess for Unity and Unreal, you need to go and code in their system with whatever uh, their, in their ecosystem at whatever they give you. I'm not really sure if you can just use your JavaScript skills to build a game there. So that was the reason I tried looking at Unity itself, but uh, I wasn't really sure with the entire coding ecosystem, and I wasn't very comfortable with it. Okay, somebody has started playing this game. Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is all plain JS. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So uh, two questions. One, like, uh, can I you hold it closer to your? Yeah. Mind? So I saw some uh, like. I, I played some games on Facebook, Messenger, HTML games, and they were really, they had great graphics and they had like real uh, native experience. On, so on a phone or on a desktop? On, on a phone. Okay, awesome. On a phone. So, uh, do you know something about that one and two, uh, like, like this uh, progressive web thing, do you see that becoming a big market going in future or something on those lines? Uh, so, I am not very sure about, so his question is, there are games on Facebook Messenger, uh, if what goes on behind the scenes are there, am I, sh am I right? Yeah, so I'm not really 100% uh, sure about it, but heard that it uses some portions of React Native as well to, you know, uh, on fly deploy them. And B, if progressive web games are becoming a thing, so there's this website, outweb.io, which lists a good amount of progressive web apps, and it has a, a section which ga uh, of games, you can go and check out the games. This was just my trial to uh, bringing this thing in spotlight that we can start making similar kind of game experiences that native ga games uh, provide today. Uh, 2048 is one of the best game experiences, even though I don't know if it gives, uh, if it uses Service Worker, but it was the first one to come out with App Cache and give offline experiences, but yeah. That was one of the very first and awesome games that I played on there. Uh, question there. Hey, um, so I've been looking at the documentation and I'm unable to find some like real world examples of like, I see this as being one of the examples, but I can't find other projects Sam, which Sam are using like proper build tools and stuff to setup. actually like there. have an example okay. to start with, right? All I see is this playground of ba Babylon JS, but if I save the file, it's just like one HTML5 and they're like tiny examples. So yeah, I'm so that like you're using ESX and all of that, right? Yeah. But uh, even a even the NPM project doesn't have how to use it as an NPM project. Okay, I can take that as a feedback. Maybe we can start something of on, yeah. on uh, because yes, so Babylon JS has a playground uh, kind of it kind of a ripple that uh, Babel and other, even Facebook native gives. 
uh, sorry, React Native gives. Uh, so it has similar kind of thing, but not really an end-to-end -end documented process on how to use it. But uh, honestly, if you use it from NPM, it's just like any other uh, NPM module. Just import whatever you needed from, ba from Babylon, and, or maybe import star from Babylon, and just start using it. So I tried to build a similar application, uh, PWA, in Android Marshmallow. So I faced the challenge saying it was kind of not working in Lollipop and below Android versions. Also, there was some problem with Redmi custom UI. So I was trying to kind of uh, uh, use different sensors here, accelerometer and uh, gyroscope. But the sensor was not working. I was not getting any value. So is there any challenge with respect to interaction with your OS? And uh, so uh, the thing with web apps is that browsers encapsulate a lot of your uh, interactions with sensors, interaction with uh, as gestures you do. So it shouldn't be a direct challenge to OS, but more of a browser version that we can check if it's not working in. I'd be like, feel more than happy to take it back to Chrome team. Ah, so app icons and iOS is still is with uh, Apple icon manifest and the link tag with it. Uh, the manifest does not really work. However, uh, you just have to still give them the same link rel tags to give the icon of the particular web page. The display full screen will not work. This might, this will definitely not work in an uh, off, offline scenario. But yeah, it's playable. Still, it's still it's playable. You just go to this particular, or you add it to your home screen whenever you open, if you have a network. Sadly, as of now, it does not support offline. Uh, so if you have a network, you will be able to play just the way Android users play it. Yeah. Cool. Some other questions? Okay, sure. Hello. Hello. Hi, what about the performance implication when you, you know, close the application or put it on standby because the animation frame will still be running in the background, right? So Pardon? Uh, what about the performance impl implications when you, you know, like uh, close the application, not close it completely, you know, move to another application and stuff like that. Will the animation cycles be running in the background? Uh, mostly, as far as I know, Babylon JS has a mode to switch it to request any fr animation frame. So if in that case, you uh, switch to other application or you just press home screen, Request animation frame will not fire anymore, and then that will just your game will just be paused. Pause. There. Yeah. And even if it's just a note there, even if it's not supported in the uh, render loop uh, where we uh, where we wrote uh, scene dot render, I'll just quickly show you. Yeah, yeah, this one. Just wrap this scene dot render inside a request animation frame, and you should be good to go. Since All request right. animation frame will yeah. not fire. for the talk. Uh, I just want to ask, I've heard of Debug JS. Like, how is it like working on the web app? How is it actually going to work? Like, is it uh, different from the performance of the web? Oh, it's definitely performant. Babylon JS just happened to be a little more helpful in case of games, whereas 3JS is a very generic thing for any kind of uh, 3D animation. I literally build VR uh, animation, uh, uh, VR applications with it. Uh, in 3JS on a mobile web uh, and browser. So it works fine, it is performant, though you might need to do uh, some tweaks here and there, but just baby launch happens to be a little more friendly for game development. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.